of his name. For such a one, the world of darkness is transformed into a world of light, and the fleeting world into one that shall exist forever and ever. The tragedy of the First Crusade was not only in the lives that were lost, but what was profoundly tragic was the growth of hostility among the common people towards the Jews. For this hostility, born of religious differences, would never disappear. In some ways, the First Crusade was like a nightmare. It passed and seemed to leave the world unchanged. The Jewish communities of the Rhineland recovered and re-established themselves. But the memory of those events would not die even in the prosperous days that followed. The 12th century that now began ushered in a period of expansion and development for the Christian lands of Europe. Towns and cities grew as men left the countryside to become merchants and craftsmen. In these walled towns, burgs they were called in German, a new class emerged, the burghers, in French, the bourgeois. For each of the trades in a town, there was an association or a guild with its insignia and its meeting hall. There were guilds for merchants, for tanners, vintners, weavers, glaziers, for every imaginable occupation. The craftsmen of the guilds were of humble origin, peasants from the countryside or simple villagers. They feared to include in their ranks any men of different background. Almost without exception, the guilds were closed to Jews, excluding them from most aspects of the new economic order. But the growth of trade and commerce also offered new opportunities. And as shipments of goods swelled and laborers had to be paid, one thing came to be needed in great quantity, money. Currency was necessary for economic growth and coins became such a valuable commodity that men paid interest of more than 30% to borrow them. Christians were forbidden by the Catholic Church to lend money to other Christians for profit. And as the demand for money increased, Jews responded by providing the needed loans. It was a natural economic move for them. As merchants, they had had experience in keeping accounts and managing credit. And although in time Italian moneylenders would displace them, for the moment, Jews became the source of money for investments. Nowhere in Europe were Jewish moneylenders more prosperous and useful than in 12th century England. From his home in Lincoln, a man known to history only as Aaron of Lincoln, controlled a network of investments that extended to 25 counties. He and other Jews helped finance the construction of buildings across all of England, including dozens of abbeys and monasteries and at least two cathedrals. Jews in financing the new economy was a productive one everywhere. The Jews flocked to France from diverse parts of the world because peace abode among the French and the kings of that land were merciful toward their subjects. They made a long sojourn in Paris where they prospered so that they claimed as their own almost half of the city and employed Christians in their houses as men servants and maid servants. In many of the German towns, Jews were accepted as citizens, and in some places, they were even granted public office. The Ashkenazim, once almost insignificant in number, 
now expanded more rapidly than any other Jewish community in the world. The heart of their settlement was in Germany, and German became the everyday language for most of the Ashkenazic Jews. They mixed with it elements of their ancient language, Hebrew, to create a dialect that would come to be known as Yiddish. In the spirit and vitality of their customs, in their separateness as a community, they found fulfillment. Jews everywhere shared in and stimulated the growth of Christian Europe. In Spain, Christian armies continued to reconquer the land from its Muslim rulers. By the middle of the 12th century, thousands of Spanish Jews had been brought under Christian rule. In Toledo alone, a Christian city in the north, the Jewish population was said to number 70,000. While Berber rulers brought intolerance to Muslim Spain, Jewish refugees were welcomed in Toledo. They arrived carrying precious manuscripts of philosophy, poetry, and science. Their knowledge would help to save the heritage of Moorish Spain from the flames of destruction. Their golden age would now be kept alive in the lands of Christian Spain. In the synagogues of Christian Toledo, the patterns and motifs upon the walls demonstrate the debt of the Jews to their Moorish past. <laughs> Jewish scholars from Muslim Spain were welcomed to this city, and they made it a gateway of knowledge for Europe to the north. They became the great translators of the works of Arab philosophy and science into Hebrew and Latin. Christians from all of Europe came to Toledo to study from Jewish scholars. From this process of exchange, Northern Europe first learned the decimal system of numbers. With the help of Jews, the works of Hippocrates, Euclid and Aristotle were translated from Arabic and made available to Christian scholars. A world of knowledge that the Europeans had hardly known to exist was suddenly opened before their eyes. It was the age of the great cathedrals of Chartres and Notre Dame, an age of technological advances of mechanical clocks, water mills, and spinning wheels. The 12th and 13th centuries exploded with creativity and a spirit of exploration. Marco Polo set off for China. Universities were born, and avid students read the works of Arab and Jewish scholars works of science, mathematics, medicine, and philosophy. New knowledge broke upon Christian Europe with the force of revelation. The church had to face the probes and questions of philosophy and respond to them not out of faith alone, but with reasoned and philosophical argument church scholars turned to Arab and Greek and Jewish philosophy, searching eagerly to infuse the doctrines of the church with the new spirit of rationalism. Thomas Aquinas, the most luminous mind among the church scholastics, found in the works of Maimonides, the great Jewish philosopher, a means of reconciling faith with reason and he set about constructing a philosophical stronghold for the medieval Christian faith. 
Man has a natural desire to know the causes of whatever he sees. Through wondering at what they saw, men first began to philosophize. But God is the first cause of all. Therefore, man's last end is to know God. It was a time of charity and humanity within the church, a time when the monastic orders sought to renew the ideal of poverty and simplicity in the service of faith. The time of St. Bernard and of St. Francis of Assisi, of quiet dedication to nature and human kindness. But in this complex era, the church was sometimes threatened with movements of revolt. When reason and persuasion could not prevail over those who questioned its doctrines, the church began to respond with force. It established commissions of inquiry to seek out heretics. Thousands of dissenters lost their lives. Feeling its position threatened on many sides, the church hardened its policy also toward the Jews. The church sought to isolate them, lest Jewish beliefs draw Christians away from the church. For the competition between the faiths had never really stopped. In the year 1215, a church council at the Lateran Palace in Rome issued a decree. In certain provinces, such a confusion has arisen that Jews and Christians cannot be distinguished. We hereby order that the Jews in every Christian province shall be marked off in the eyes of the public to the character of their dress. In many places, Jews were required to wear yellow badges and pointed hats. The purpose was to separate them from Christians. A quarter century later, Pope Gregory IX took a step that would strike at the heart of the Jewish heritage. Since the Talmud is said to be the main reason the Jews remain obstinate in their mistaken faith, we herewith order that on the first Saturday of the Lent to come in the morning, while the Jews are gathered in the synagogues, you shall seize all the books of the Jews who live in your districts. Jews felt themselves threatened as never before threatened in their very identity. For it was the Talmud that held the Jewish people together from generation to generation and through all the lands of their dispersion. In Paris, the Talmud was subjected to a public trial and judged guilty of defaming Christians. As Jewish onlookers wept, 24 cartloads of handwritten manuscripts were burned But the laws and edicts of the church could not be enforced without the approval of the local rulers. And while some rulers applied the anti-Jewish regulations, most did not. Their interests lay in the well-being of the Jews and the prosperity they brought to their realms. Life in the castles of the Middle Ages would grow more luxurious as time went by and more costly. It was a life sustained at first by lands and holdings and the peasants who worked those lands. But as the need for money grew, the nobles turned to taxation taxation of the moneylenders and taxation of the people through the moneylenders. The people who were taxed in this manner were often those who could least afford to pay. A peasant who needed money to tide him over a bad harvest. Or an aristocrat who had to mortgage his lands to pay off his debts. The Jews who provided loans found themselves forced by rulers to charge ever-increasing rates. It was an impossible situation. 
the first signs of conflict began to appear as early as the 12th century. In England, the kings had been taxing the profits of Jewish moneylenders since the days of the Norman conquest. The Jews had come to serve as tools of the royal treasury in raising money from local aristocrats. By the late 12th century, many lords were unable to repay their debts to the Jews. In 1189, a group of nobles instigated riots against the Jews. The first was in London, but soon riots broke out in other towns as well. In March of 1190, local barons in the town of York plotted to murder their Jewish creditors. The Jews fled for protection to Clifford's Tower. A mob gathered, and the barons incited them to attack the fortress. The whole of the workpeople, the youth of the town, and a large number of country folk joined in the cruel business as if each man was seeking his own gain. The attackers rejoiced in the certainty of their approaching victory. On the morning when the mob finally forced its way into the tower, it found many of the Jews dead by their own hands. Those who were still alive were slaughtered on the spot. The violence that erupted in England was a somber warning. Where economic resentment was added to religious animosity, the hatred that resulted could not be contained. All across Europe, in varying degrees, Jews acted as intermediaries for rulers in exacting money from their subjects. This then was the sequence. Kings and nobles protected the Jews for a time and borrowed heavily from them in order to be able to govern. They then taxed the Jews heavily in order to recoup a part of their expenses. The burden of this tax was passed on to the people. As taxation grew heavy, the bourgeois of the cities and the peasants of the countryside began to rebel against both the nobles and the Jews. Juries were ransacked and nobles assaulted. At this moment of crisis, with rebellion threatening, rulers across Europe began to see the Jews as a political liability. In order to appease their subjects, the rulers now ended their relationship with the Jews. We, Charles II, for the honor of God and preferring to provide for the peace of our subjects rather than to fill our coffers, Although we enjoy extensive temporal benefit from the Jews, do expel from our counties all Jews, not only for the present, but for all times. In what can only be termed an epidemic of expulsions, nobles everywhere began to rid their domains of Jewish communities. In 1290, Edward I banished the Jews of England, 16,000 in number, and confiscated their property. They would not be allowed to return for almost four centuries. Sixteen years later, Philip the Fair expelled the Jews of France and seized their goods. Later, they would be readmitted when it seemed profitable to the king and expelled again when he had gotten from them all he could. Only in Germany, where the land was broken into countless territories and where town governments shared in the profits of money lending, did Jews remain, but in great insecurity. The 14th century world, in which thousands of Jews now found themselves adrift, still retained many elements of the Dark Ages. For the unlearned, it was still a world ruled by magic and miracles. People thought fireflies were the souls of infants who had died before they could be baptized, and that heart attacks were the work of demons. Phenomena not otherwise accounted for were attributed to the influence of the planets, or finally, to the will of God. But in 1347, there occurred an event so terrifying 
so devastating that no explanation, not even the will of God, seemed adequate. In October of that year, a Genoese trading ship drifted into harbor at Messina in Sicily. Its sailors were slumped over their oars, all of them dead or dying. On board was a terror known as the Black Death, the bubonic plague. In January of 1348, infected sailors carried the plague to France via Marseille and then to North Africa via Tunis. It spread westward from Marseille to Spain and then northward up the Rhone. It spread to Rome and Florence, to Paris and Normandy, and then across the Channel to southern England. No country escaped its ravages. The contemporary descriptions are shocking. The common people fell sick daily by the thousands. A great many breathed their last in the public streets, day and night. Everywhere, the city was teeming with corpses. People would drag them out of their homes and pile them in front of the doors. It was not uncommon to see a single beer carrying husband and wife, two or three brothers, father and son, and others besides. The disease began as swellings in the armpits or groin that sometimes grew to be the size of eggs. The swellings quickly spread over the entire body and turned to black and livid blotches. In two years, the bubonic plague claimed some 24 million lives, one third of Europe's population. It shredded every legal and human bond that held medieval society together. In despair, people looked everywhere for an explanation, looked everywhere for a way to halt the plague before it killed them all. A rumor spread from city to city that Jews had poisoned the wells. Pope Clement VI came to their defense. Recently, we have heard that certain Christians, seduced by the devil, are blaming the Jews for the pestilence which God is afflicting upon the Christian people. But this pestilence is all but universal. It afflicts both the Jews themselves and many other people that have no contact with the Jews. The accusation against the Jews is absurd. In vain, Pope Clement argued for reason. Throughout Europe, communities were attacked. 2,000 Jews were burned in Strasbourg, thousands more in Mainz social order disintegrated, and the number of Jews murdered by the mob grew steadily. It is a dangerous platitude to say that the Jews of Europe were made a scapegoat. It is dangerous because it explains nothing. It does not explain the anger felt everywhere against the Jews that led not only to the killings of this period, but also to the anti-Jewish attitude among Europeans that was to survive for the next 500 years. In the course of the Middle Ages, the Jews had come to be resented by the common people for complex religious and economic reasons. Religious resentment was born of the unfortunate competition between the Jewish and the Christian faiths that had started more than a thousand years before. That competition had resulted in formal action by the church that had further alienated the Christians from the Jews. But the economic resentment of this period was new, and when combined with religious and social differences, it proved to be the most destructive of all. The Jewish communities of medieval France would never recover. Those in Germany 